All right, well, I think we'll get underway. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nora Polovich with the North Peace Applied Research Association. We are located in the peace country of Northern Alberta. We are a nonprofit group directed by a producer board and we conduct applied research and extension, applied agriculture research and extension. And uh, we have offices in Manning and uh, the farm just uh, south and west of town. And tonight is the last in our series. Jay and I were just saying that the last three weeks have flown by. We're in the last of our series of the gardening webinar. And I'll do a quick intro of Jay in case this is your first evening joining us. Jay is a longtime conservationist who grew up in the Dakotas on a small livestock and grain farm. And he, he has built his career taking care of our very important resource, the soil. And Jay worked at the Natural Resources Conservation Service with the USDA based out of Bismarck, North Dakota. And he has shared his knowledge and passion on soil health right around the globe. So for the last two weeks, and this is our third one, as I said, Jay has been sharing with us how we can apply the principles of soil health to gardening. Last week, we started off with a few questions. Um, Jay, we don't have any questions tonight to start off with, but I have to tell you that I have received a multitude of emails thanking you very much for the last few sessions as people have learned so much and appreciated so much um, the information that you have shared with us. And I, I must say, I was pretty excited after our last session to, to get going and we've had some warm weather. So uh, a lot of us are getting antsy to get out there and start applying some of what we've learned from you. So uh, good evening, Jay, welcome. And tonight it is flowers, herbs and pollinators. Okay, very good. Well, good evening, uh, Nora, and good evening, everyone, whether you're in Alberta or where, wherever uh, you are watching from. And so um, we're just going to jump right into this this evening and uh, start down the road. And as Nora mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking about flowers, herbs, and pollinators. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, Nora, does that show uh, PowerPoint for Garden Series 3 of 3? It certainly does, yep. Okay, okay. So we're going we're gonna to continue to go down our gardening path a little bit further. And uh, I want to talk this evening a little bit about flowers, herbs, and pollinators. And uh, I, uh, for those of you that um, might not have been on the previous sessions, um, you know, I came to the table late uh, in gardening. And I was a, a longtime conservationist, and my my uh, kind of the basis of my work was monitoring systems. And so, if it was a cropping system, grazing system, cover crops, um, plant physiology, soil function, those, those type things. And so, I added the uh, the gardening thing uh, later, and just wish I could go back and have added it a lot earlier than I did. It's a big topic, it's a complex topic. Uh, it's one that I think affects us directly. And so um, with that, we're gonna add these last three items here as we've been talking about recently about building our ecosystem. And so when we're building an ecosystem, in this case, uh, the gardening ecosystem, there's a lot of different components. And I think the flowers, herbs, and pollinators uh, might be helpful. So we're going to walk into those. And then I hope to save a little time at the end as we kind of do a bit of a summary. And we kind of connect the three together just a bit. So with that, um, I'm going to move forward. So this evening, a lot of the herb information, um, I, I like to utilize this uh, organic gardening book of Rodale's. Uh, it has a lot of good information. Carrots love tomatoes also, okay. And then uh, I have an additional one I'll be adding to the list here when we get into it just a little bit further. But a lot of good information on herbs and flowers uh, in those type books and they're very helpful. And so, especially for somebody like myself um, who hasn't gone into some of this very far yet. So we'll start with flowers. And uh, you know, why flowers? Well, 
for, for me, when I look at this ecosystem, they create food and a home for the insect and the pollinator world and the aesthetics. And so my idea of aesthetics was always, uh, well, certain colors seem to attract some of the biology, some of the insect world more than others. And uh, even this, uh, this is the cucumber plant here in the um, high tunnel at the Minokan farm, and I just captured this guy on the other side of the uh, leaf here, the cucumber leaf. This is actually a cucumber hanging right here. And so we start to see how, how this ecosystem can can work and bring some of these uh, people together from the insect world. So last year, this is my confession here, last year was my first year I ever grew a flower. And so <clears throat> I grew, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, balsam, zinnia, and marigolds. And I grew them <clears throat> in combination. I took one of my beds, took the entire bed, and planted them from seed. And I remember thinking, man, I just don't know if that's worth it. Or, you know, I'm thinking, ah, I just don't know. I've never grown a flower. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should try to buy a transplant or something, but I put the seeds in. I was so amazed at how they, how they grew. Now I did use um, a liquid bio inoculant uh, that, you know, from the vermicompost that we talked about and I extract liquid out of that Burma compost. I apply it to the seeds, but I was really impressed with how the annuals took off and, and uh, they, they did quite well. The smaller ones here uh, are the balsam. So these would be the balsam right in here. These larger ones here were the, were the zinnias. And I think it was called California giant is what I had recalled. And then there's an understory underneath here where there's a little bit of sunlight here and there where the marigolds existed. So the three of those, that was my, my first attempt. And they were all annuals. And so I thought, well, that went okay. And you can see here as their progression went for the year, there was virtually, I virtually did no weeding uh, in that bed either. I was so amazed at um, how the, how the flowers just grew so quickly. So now I'm considering some perennials and I'm starting to look at, at studying a little bit on these right here that I've got listed. So I'm looking at some perennials for the future, could be outside. I'll see how, how I put that together yet. But um, what I wanna do with these is I want them to be part of my rotation, okay? And then for, for me and the and when I look at the insect world, very important what the colors are. So I try to have a diversity of colors. So again, the zinnias are these taller ones here. The zinnias actually went to the, the ceiling of the high tunnel. They're already on a raised bed. So I grew them on this raised bed, but they, they went all the way to the ceiling. The balsams are much smaller. They went about halfway, but the zinnias just didn't seem to stop. Now, uh, all of these colors are important and they all seem to do their own thing as far as attracting a pollinator or playing a role uh, in the insect world. So I like to get a diversity of colors. For me, if I just picked one out, uh, what I observe is I seem to get a lot of activity with the yellow, but then again, it's probably depends on what the insect is too. But um, yellow is one that I definitely like to always have in there. Uh, but but it's a diversity of colors. It plays a role. So the balsam has got a multitude of colors. You know, it's got uh, rose and it's got uh, this pink. They're just really beautiful colors. So I just really enjoyed the aesthetics of them, as well as adding that color diversity. And there's kind of a violet. And then I looked them up, and balsam typically uh, rose, purple red, white, and pink are, are fairly common for balsam. Uh, but they, the other thing that really impressed me was they continued to bloom. So they bloomed for a long period of time. And anytime you can have a, a bloom period that's lengthened like that, I think then you're offering food in a home for a longer period of time. <clears throat> Plus it's just a longer period of time to enjoy them. So this was my, my first try at flowers. I don't know what would have happened if I'd have failed on them, but 
they did pretty well. And then <clears throat> as far as um, 2021, what I'm gonna plant this year, I got a number of annuals down here. And these are the annuals that I plan to use uh, in 2021. So I've already got this seed and I plan on planting those uh, this spring. And so that kind of gives you an idea. These are, these are all annuals here, the marigold, the balsam, and the zinnia. And these are all annuals down here. And then the previous slide or two there, I was looking at the perennials as well. And so I, I think I want this to be part of my rotation. And so maybe this bed is gonna go to um, uh, something, this might be beans, um, might be tomatoes, uh, might be lettuce, but I want it to be part of my rotation because that helps build my ecosystem. And so that, that makes a huge difference and the flowers have just been a great addition for that. You can also get uh, packets like this, um, the local soil districts in North Dakota. This one is at Lemoore, uh, that's in the Southeast part of North Dakota. But this, a lot of the soil districts sell these packets. And in these packets, you're gonna find like this one is $30 for one pound. That's enough for a hundred by hundred foot area. That's, that's, that's a pretty big area when you're talking gardening. To me, that would be a large area. But what I love on this information is it has early, mid and late bloom periods. And so when I, when I wanna find something that is going to be used in this ecosystem, I want early, I want mid, I want late. I think that's very helpful. And then in addition to that, they have the color or at least the dominant color. And so then you start to get this variety of colors. And so consequently, if I can see this information and I can see this information, uh, that helps me put together something that, that I'm going to use. And so consequently, you can get some uh, perennial mixtures like this as well. And, and I find those very helpful. And so, uh, you know, one pound of that type of seed, that's a big area. And it, it starts to build that ecosystem. I see they also have a little uh, native clump grass in here. Blue grama and side oats grama for us, they would, um, that is not rhizominous species, that's a clump grass. And they're typically uh, warm seasons. And they become a great plate, great habitat uh, for the insect world as well. So I see they have a little bit of grass in it also. So consequently, this is just an option that you see from time to time. I think that's a nice way, uh, you know, especially when, when someone's, you know, some entity has gone through the work of seeing that it's kind of local, local type species. And then I think we're in, in pretty good business. So this is still my kind of my favorite color. Uh, so even like a sunflower here, you know, and, and we grow sunflower at the Minokan farm as well on the cropland. And I use some sunflower at the garden. And so it's still kind of my favorite color, but I've learned to appreciate all the diversity of colors. I want to touch on herbs a little bit. And um, uh, herbs generally refer to the leafy part the leafy green or the flowering part of a plant. And uh, well, spices are usually the dr dried and they're produced from other parts of the plant, including seed, bark, roots, and fruits. And so that kind of helps uh, me understand the entire herb world. And I was looking at that uh, earlier today and evidently in the UK, you would probably say herb. And in the US, you'd probably say herb. I, I kind of consider either one correct. There's different parts of the world use that word differently. So this is what I plan to do in 2021. Uh, I plan to use about 12 different herbs. And this is the listing of what I intend to plant. And so it gives me a pretty good diversity. I don't need, um, but maybe a few plants of each. And so if you have two or three plants, those of you that are long ways down the road on herbs. Um, you know, you'd know much more about this than I do. I bring them in and I use them from a diversity viewpoint. And it also helps us understand, um, I think a, I looked at a list today of, I think the name of the list was like common herbs in North America. And there was over 50 
So these are my herbs from last year. So I had one frame that I uh, took and, and used it. And so I had a little bit of rosemary and a little bit of basil and a little thyme and oregano, and celery, and cilant parsley, cilantro, and, and lemongrass all the way in the back here. <clears throat> so there, um, a couple of years ago, I grew basil. I grew an entire row of basil. And parts of the row was kind of missing and parts was a little close together. And so I took the ones where it was very heavy. I took every other one out and I popped it into the open areas. And I was just amazed, basil just didn't care. It just kept growing. And so I was able to get a whole nice row out of it just by spacing it out with a little bit of a garden trowel. I just would kind of lightly took them out, replanted them. Uh, that, that was amazing. So that, that's a hardy plant when you can do that. And so consequently, these are kind of the ones that we typically, I shouldn't say typically, but these are the ones that I went with this past year. Okay. And I think they offer a lot of things that you can do with them. Um, mostly in the, uh, uh, the culinary world and, and, uh, as we look at them, but also this is one my wife does. Uh, she takes lemongrass and she uh, extracts that out and uses a bit of olive oil, et cetera. And she mixes those together and uses that for like woodworking. So like uh, when you put, put um, an oil on your, on your uh, kitchen cabinets or other woodwork, um, this gives it a real nice lemony smell. If you've ever taken lemongrass and you just chew on one of the leaves, you know instantly why it's called lemongrass. It's just got such a distinct taste. And I think that's one of the definitions of what an herb is. It has this aromatic, it's uh, got a great smell or taste or both. And so it's very distinctive. And then we usually put them into this uh, herb world. And so I haven't gone down the herb world very long yet, but I've already put it into the rotation. So like flowers, Herbs are part of the rotation. And then we typically use a, a dehydrator. And so the dehydrator works out really good. Sometimes if the weather's uh, kind of hot and dry, this works out pretty good too. Uh, you can hang them on some type of rack and that works out just fine. Uh, but normally uh, we're gonna put them in a dehydrator and, and dry those leaves. So this is a peek inside one of our cupboards at home here. Um, Kathy does a good job on this and she puts these together in little jars and gets them labeled. So you don't need uh, but a plant or two. And so we grow some of these at home here and, and we go ahead and then uh, dry them and get them into a little labeled jar. And, and then in addition to that, uh, we also take some of these and use them in terms of uh, mixtures. So you can mix your own blends. Uh, this is just a, I think it's a paleo diet book as I recall, but it had a lot of good mixtures in it. <clears throat> and so the mixtures are very helpful. And so you can, you can follow the recipe or I think what's even more fun is you can make your own. And so Kathy makes her own and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. But uh, I mentioned the Rodale Organic Gardening Book. And in there, you're gonna find sections. One of them is herbs for shady gardens. So if you got a lot of shade in your garden, th this would be the preferred list. Herbs for borders. So they can play a role in your ecosystem on the border. And then herbs for tea. And so there's lots of different ones that you can make, you can dry and, and make a, a nice tea out of. Culinary herbs, fragrant herbs, and also herbs for repelling pests. And so they, you can find these different lists because there is a huge amount of total number of herbs available that you can take a look at. And these lists are pretty extensive. So it gives you a good, uh, a good amount of uh, flexibility and diversity to work from. But what I wanted to kind of share with you about the herbs and how, how we use them, <clears throat> excuse me, Kathy and I uh, journal. So we keep a, a, a diet journal. And so everything we eat um, all, you know, the entire day, you, you know, all your meals and snacks, we record them all and we record the uh, sodium, the calories and the carbs. 
And uh, since I'm on a bit of a uh, low sodium diet, we use the herbs to, to move in and take that place of what used to be a much larger component of, of sodium. And so we've been able to successfully, when I say the word, when I say the term we, I'm being a little bit loose on that is basically Kathy, has been able to take out about half of our sodium intake and replace it with herb and herb mixtures. And so it's, it was real important for us to build our own and make our own. So, so she does that very successfully. And so that is built into our daily diet. And so uh, just as an example, the, these, this is a weekly average. So I averaged the last week. So my sodium intake, my calorie intake, that, that's a daily, an average, day, average daily intake over the past week. So that, that lets me know exactly where I'm at on things. And we, kind of, we both do this. Uh, so we spend a little bit of time after each meal. It takes, takes a few minutes after each meal just to record everything. Uh, all that data is available on the container that you purchased or on an app. If you didn't, if you grew it yourself, there's apps that you can look at that give you this type of information. And then we use some of this mixture uh, recipe information and then customize it. And uh, because, because the sodium for us is um, pretty essential that we get that uh, at about 50% of what most people are at probably um, for health purposes. And so herbs, I got nothing but good to say about them because they have helped me tremendously. And, and so just kind of wanted to share that a little bit with you, but there's there's a lot to the whole herb world. And, and as I'm going more into it and, and setting up with the planting for this coming uh, spring, I hope to find a little bit more information about that as well. So I wanna to touch on pollinators uh, also as the third item. And <clears throat> when we talk about pollinators, I want you to think about it in terms of um, anything that helps carry pollen you know, from the stamen to the stigma. So anything that helps pollinate this plant. And so there's a lot of different types of, of pollinators. I wanna talk a little bit about that. This is the book that I probably use the most. Uh, it's uh, Xerxes Society, uh, Attracting Native Pollinators. And again, I would really uh, encourage uh, any plantings that you do to enhance your garden. I would try to use, especially the perennials, I would try to use as much native type um, plant materials that you can find. And uh, there's lots of sources for that. And, and I think that is w well worth it because it's something that basically was designed to fit into your landscape a long time ago. And so I think it's always good to use those. Uh, Xerxes Society, if you go to this particular website, you're going to find a North American map like this. And you can see Alberta uh, is right in here with North Dakota. We're kind of put into the same general area here. But uh, you click on your location and then you could start going into a lot of their information and uh, well done and, and very helpful. So I got a list of things here that I uh, put together that are different uh, pollinators. Kind of gives you an idea, you know, whether it's a, a fly or whether it's an ant or bumblebee or honeybee or hummingbird or bats and moths and butterflies. These are all pollinators. You even read a little bit now about um, humans or hand pollination. And so I read a little bit about uh, the hand pollinating occurring in apple orchards in China, for instance. And so I'm uh, not sure how I feel about that uh, because of some of the environments are uh, so heavy into pesticide use that the pollinator can't exist. And so the hand pollination occurs with a toothbrush or some type of small little paintbrush. And so, we take for granted a lot of this work that's been done from pollinators uh, for our food supply over the years, but they are immeasurable as far as the, the value of them. But my point on this particular page is that, you know, virt there's, there's just virtually no end to what can be a pollinator. So even, even people uh, can be a pollinator. 
So this is a picture of Mrs. Spear uh, in the backyard. And, and when you are looking at the pollinator world, what can you do in your garden? So these are just things we've done in our backyard. So we got um, three little areas. So we got one right here. And these are all perennial plants. Uh, also have some warm season grass in there, big blue stem, etc. And so it's not a real large area. Uh, it's maybe uh, not much more than uh, 15 by 25, so it's not real big. And then we got a second one here with some perennial plants and some different colors with the irises, etc. And we have a third one over here where we got a, a larger uh, clump of native grass. And so collectively, these three kind of play a role. And then I just kind of listed the species that we that we have in there. By no means complete, it's kind of a work in progress, but um, it's amazing how many butterflies, bees, et cetera, and the activity that occurs in it. Especially with some of these species having longer periods of time or trading off with another species that comes in and starts to bloom. <clears throat> so the two together get a long bloom period and you, you start to um, what I like to call uh, islands of life. And so in this particular picture, you know, there's basically three islands of life. So we got one, two, and three. And, and when you have them all in kind of proximity and you have some water available, et cetera, you start to see a lot of this activity occur. And so I think there's a lot of things that we can do in a garden to make this work. It doesn't have to be a big area, but it helps build your ecosystem. <clears throat> the, the native grass, I strongly encourage if you're, if you're gonna look at putting some additional habitat in, <clears throat> you, the native species, I like the warm season species like these are. And so you have something like little blue stem and something like a big blue stem and uh, side oats grama. And I think we also have a little bit of switchgrass. They're all warm season clump grasses. They're not gonna spread by the root. So they're well behaved in your landscape and they get to be a large plant and they become a habitat. And so as you can see here in some of Xerxes information that they provide nesting sites and protection for bumblebees, bumblebee queens even to overwinter. But, and, and as a butterfly host, and the more you have it, the more, the more life you see. So these are nice to put in. You can get them, sometimes you can get them as a plug uh, that you would just uh, uh, plant into the ground as, as a, a root mass. That's a nice way to do it. Uh, or you can get the seed packets and you can get them started that way too. So definitely strongly encourage them uh, and borders, that type of thing for your ecosystem. Gives a little bit of habitat and the color. The colors are beautiful. This one, a uh, little blue stem right here, that'll turn brilliant red in the fall. So you'll go, for, you'll, you'll have a nice color change. And the big blue stem has a big turkey foot on top of it as a seed head. So it's very distinctive. It looks like a large turkey foot. Side oats grama is just that, all the seed is on the side. Uh, and so you can see right here, if you look carefully, you can see the seed hanging on the side, that's side oats grama. So all of these play roles, but they bring habitat. So strongly encourage if you're gonna use some grass plants that they be native and warm season clump grass is, would be a good starting point. So this is another item in our backyard. Um, after, after I clean off some of the area a little bit in the fall, some of that I'm gonna clean up a bit because I want some bare soil. That might sound strange after the conversations that we had the last two sessions, but, and, and I stress little, but a little bit of bare soil is great from the viewpoint of native bee nesting. And so about 70% of the native bees use, use uh, uh, soil, soil cavities uh, for nesting. And you can see I've got some activity. I took this picture just the other day. You can see I got some activity happening. And for these native bee species that do the ground nesting, they're estimated at about 2,800 species in North America. So there, there's a lot of them, and, and about 70% of all the native 
all the native bees are ground nesting. So they're gonna lay their eggs in there, okay? And in the spring, those are going to hatch. And then Xerxes also mentions a little bit here about squash bees. So I uh, dug out some information I had at the Minokan farm on squash bees. And I took this picture at the Minokan farm in the evening. And so this was an evening photo. And you notice the blossom is starting to fill in with, with, with uh, pollinator bees. And, and this is morning. And the way this works is these are typically, not always, but these are typically males. And so the males are going to crawl in here for the night. And in the morning, uh, the females, the ladies, come along foraging early in the morning, and the males are already there. And then life goes on. And so it's, it's quite ingenious, actually. But if you get a chance sometimes, um, not every blossom is always going to have a male squash bee in it, but you'll find them. And so I, I was kind of lucky on this shot. They picked up a few of them at one time late in the evening. And then in the morning, uh, as I said, they come out. And uh, once, once the females start foraging, they come out. And so squash bees are, are pretty interesting and they're pretty specific uh, to what they do. The other, the other part of these native, uh, native uh, bees are cavity nesting. And so this is just a photo of myself um, uh, the other day out at the Minokan farm. I drilled out all the holes in the motel. I call this the Minokan Farm Motel. And, and I've got about three different sizes of uh, holes drilled in here, okay? And you, you wanna re-drill them each year. And so you always wanna clean them out, okay? And so I hadn't cleaned this one for a little while, but I got it cleaned out. So it's re ready for new nesting to come in, okay? And so about 30% of the native beer, bees are cavity nesting. And so this is, um, I got small, medium, and large rooms because they come in small, medium, and large sizes. And so this kind of fits everybody. It's got 25 rooms and a little bit of a roof on it. So it keeps the, you know, when it rains and, and that type of thing keeps it a little bit drier. And uh, it's just something that's easy to do to uh, set up for your ecosystem on your garden. It doesn't take too much work to do it. Or you can use uh, bamboo, uh, these bamboo stalks. Uh, they also work. And then different, different bee species are going to put in different material. They're going to pack in an egg. They're going to pack in some pollen. Uh, they might pack in a little mud. Uh, they, they, they all use different materials. And so when I look at, let me go back here. When I look at uh, this little motel, uh, it's going to have all, it's going to have a few different colors uh, once they become populated and it'll have different colors on it. And it doesn't take that long. So it's real fascinating to watch what they're going to do. But mud's not uncommon, but n neither is almost any other kind of material. They're quite creative. Uh, but the bamboo is another another option because it does a similar thing, okay. And then um, I wanted to kind of share this one with you too on pollinators um, because I have kind of an appreciation for this. But um, Xerxes Society talks a little bit about um, middle C, and so with a bumblebee uh, and and middle C or bees and middle C. So as they're vibrating the stalk um, and, and this pollination is occurring and they're getting nectar, et cetera, that typically that buzz is in middle C. And I thought, um, uh, I took this photo uh, in slow motion uh, last summer. Uh, this is the Minokan Farm rain garden, okay? And I stood here and waited a little bit and then I put it on slow motion. So you, you're gonna hear the, your, their buzz uh, in slow motion. And then as luck would have it, a monarch flew by in slow motion, of course, because that's what I had my camera on. So I'm gonna play this, it's kind of, kind of neat. Actually, Jay, we can't hear it. 
And I think you just have to go back to share screen and turn on the audio. Okay, I can try that. I don't know if it matters if my volume is turned up more. See, mine wasn't very high. Okay. Okay, I can try that. Um, let me go back to share screen. Would that be new share? I believe so. Okay. And, Might have to close okay. out of it and start it again. Yeah. Okay, I'm on a screen now and I'm looking for something with volume, evidently. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure where that would be, Nora. Okay, I'm just going to stop your okay. screen sharing. Okay. And there, do you see sh their share sound? Do you see? I don't know if that shows. Well, there's a share down here. It just says share. Okay. So on the left hand side at the bottom, there should be a share sound. Oh, share computer sound. Yes. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay, we're gonna try this again. There we go, perfect. That sound is is the sound of the of the bees buzzing. And and in slow motion, it's got almost an eerie sound to it. And the first second it comes on it's in it's not slow motion yet in that first second but after that you start to hear a, like a little echo and so i just found that pretty fascinating plus the the monarch was a definite uh, bonus and you get to see a monarch in flight in slow motion and they're they're rather graceful looking so wanted to share that with you a little bit but um, i didn't understand the middle c concept and so i asked my wife about it um, who's long time uh, music background and she took me over to the piano and showed me where middle C is on the keyboard and she said it's about balance and I said okay I get it. And There's so, a request Jay if you could play it again please. Absolutely. Yeah, so it has a little bit of this um, kind of like, um, I don't know, like an echo almost, but uh, it's so different when it's in slow motion. I didn't know it would affect sound that way as well. So when the camera is working in slow motion, the sound uh, changes as well. But um, it's it's the closest I've got to capturing something and, and uh, that related close to the middle C concept of the buzz pollination that occurs. So just wanted to share that part with you uh, from the pollinator uh, viewpoint. So rain garden at the Minokan farm. Okay, then some references to um, monarch nectar plants. Um, this is the link below that gets you to this type of information. And so if you, if you take that link, it will get you plants for the Northern Plains. You can see um, it's this area right here, but that's the area that also included um, Alberta. And so uh, it's like a four page document, but it would have a list of plants that you could kind of start from or that you can talk to others about and see that there's something that would be acclimated uh, to your neck of the woods, okay? And so I think that's, that's um, Xerxes does a nice job of supplying that kind of information. And that one is for is specifically for monarchs. Uh, I showed you the photo earlier of the monarch uh, chomping on the cucumber plant. So um, there, it's kind of interesting when you see them at work and they got some plant diversity, exactly what they do. We know milkweed is real important. Uh, for their egg laying, etc., cetera. Uh, but they evidently do take into some other plants as well, which is I think what you would see if you actually uh, follow this link. And then uh, this one is just pollinator plants more in general. And you can kind of see it includes at least the Southern portion of Alberta, it appears. And uh, it's, it's pollinator plants in the Northern Plains. 
And so you can go into that one at your leisure and see what you can find that might fit uh, your ecosystem for your garden and, and uh, your, your goals that you're trying to put together. Then I had another one here. Um, this one is, uh, the link is down below. This one is uh, North Dakota pollinator plants uh, uh, via USDA link. And so it has a complete listing, uh, but I like how it's broke down with early bloom, middle bloom and late bloom. And so it's a nice listing, but it's more specific to North Dakota. Uh, some of these invariably would be fine in your neck of the woods as well. But uh, I think what's important is um, find your local information as much as you can. And that's why I think the, um, uh, the Xerxes information might be a bit more relevant because it includes more of the a larger territory you know, well into Canada. So you might find this one a little bit more appropriate. Uh, or you might find something like this, except specific to Alberta. So there's different, uh, different ways to do that, but I would try to find my local native source um, as much as I could, okay? So I wanna um, do a little bit of a summary at this point, and, and uh, then we can have some uh, Q&A. I think there'd be some time for that, but I just kind of wanna touch on connecting this a little bit. So in that first talk, we talked about carbon covers and compost. Uh, we also talked about some things like um, the four parts of carbon and how the carbon liquid exudates of a new plant in the first four to eight weeks of its life, that's where the majority of a lot of that carbon, carbon sugar is going to come into the soil. And then the cover crops can play that role as well and they can play the, the diversity role and they can play the armor or the cover. Um, the compost and uh, compost teas, compost extracts, uh, vermicompost, all of those are options. And so if you do harvest your material at the end of the year off of your garden, uh, consider composting it uh, because then you can bring it back and you can keep a, a recycle going. Compost is really, um, in the gardening world, I, I just don't know if you can beat it because it, uh, it offers so much. It has carbon, it has nutrient, um, it brings all these things to play. And uh, I, I think the compost in general is just um, a great place to start. Uh, then we went into plant diversity and who likes who. And I think when we're looking at plant diversity, we, we start to understand there's four major crop types. There's cool season grasses, warm season grasses, cool season broadleaves, warm season broadleaves. So there's four crop types. They all have a bit of a different exudates. And so, you know, when we get into this rotation thing, okay, and we start changing these crops, and that's one of our big advantages because they each, they each bring a different liquid at carbon exudate. And so, if you just grew the same plants on the same parcel of the garden year after year after year, that, that catches up with you eventually from the viewpoint of disease and vigor and those type things. But if we're willing to rotate this, then the plant diversity and then the who likes who allows some combinations to occur and you exponentially increase your diversity. So it's, it's, that's a great thing. And then, I think we also talked a little bit about um, building the ecosystem back in terms of pests. And so I don't know if any of you, uh, somebody sent uh, an email that talked about um, a slug apocalypse. Love that term. <laughs> that was just a, just a great term. And, and so um, if you look at, if you're gonna build this ecosystem back, why don't I have the predators that used to keep slugs and or any other pests in line. There was the balance, okay? And so uh, I hope some of you had a chance to watch the um, little short videos. Um, it was on slughelp.com. There was a number of little short videos, you know, it was a toad eating a slug, a frog eating a slug, chicken eating a slug, a beetle eating a slug. If you just hate slugs really bad, you wanna watch the beetle eating a slug because the slow death for the, for the slug. 
And so I think these are all parts of the predator-prey relationship, parts of our scenario that if we don't have adequate habitat, if we haven't built an ecosystem, uh, maybe got things uh, really well rototilled and bare soils, et cetera, that's the scenario that we want to keep in mind. Now this evening, uh, when we looked at bare soil that was not rototilled or tilled, uh, that bare soil had a lot to do with native bee populations and, their, and where their eggs are laid. Another reason that we try to minimize disturbance on the soil, because that whole element of native bees, there's a large population that does the ground, the ground nesting. And so this evening we talked about uh, flowers and I confess to you that it was my first time growing flowers. I grew three species and loved every minute of it because they, they just added so much to the garden. And the herbs, I've been into those a little bit longer, using them from, for our own health, Kathy and I are, and uh, they play so many other roles. And so the herb list is extensive. Uh, you can easily find uh, a list that probably shows 50 species that are adapted to certain areas of uh, North America or more. So there's a lot of them. And they're typically something that's aromatic or has a, a distinct uh, taste or smell um, that we call end up calling them herbs. And then the pollinator plants can play such a role here in building your ecosystem as well. And when you have uh, flowering plants, uh, you typically, once you have flowering plants, you're typically going to have insects. Once you have insects, you're typically going to see birds. And you know, you start to build this all back together. When we started the Minokan farm about 11 years ago, there were no birds there to speak of, and there were no insects to speak of. And so it was, wasn't until we started building a habitat that we started to improve on that. So with that, this kind of brings us to um, kind of the close of these three uh, garden series. And this is coming to you um, from, from my background as a, um, as a monitoring type person in soils and, and cropping, et cetera, and more recently gardening. Uh, but I love them all. And my personal goal is to farm forever, and in this case, garden forever. And in order to do that, we have to get to the point where we start to loop into more of a recycle. And when we recycle our nutrients and we build this ecosystem and we have this diversity of plants, you're really mimicking uh, what built your soils originally. And so we had those type things in place with the high plant diversity, high animal diversity, and it built these soils initially. And now we're, we can mimic that and build that on, on a smaller scale. And I think that's where the fun is really, and the enjoyment is, is finding, hunting and finding these plants and fitting them into an ecosystem and making this happen. So with that, Nora, I'm gonna turn it back to you. And, and if we uh, have a question or two, I'd be happy to entertain it. I think everybody on here knows by now, if I don't know the answer, I just say something like, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. And I do encourage everybody that's uh, on tonight that if you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to begin with, Jay, we have uh, just a few comments. Himalayan balsam is an invasive plant here in Alberta. Oh, question. Can you tell us about growing lemongrass? Well, the lemongrass was very easy to grow. Um, it's, it's more on the, what I think of a, on the area, maybe more of a very warm season, uh, maybe semi-tropical. Uh, it, it too went pretty much to the ceiling in the high tunnel. It was on a raised bed but the ceiling's like 11 feet and the raised bed's like four. So it, it got big. And I, I remember when we planted it, it said that it needs a lot of room. And I'm like, right. You know, how many times have I read that? And, but yeah, le lemongrass uh, does. And, and when you take the plant, rub it in your, between your fingers a bit or chew it a bit. Wow, that's distinctive. That, that lemon is just right there. And so it's, it's a great plant. I, I loved it. Uh, will I grow it again? Absolutely. Another comment, I dried calendula flowers as a tea last year and I like it as an herbal tea. B 
bee balm is also very nice and both the flowers and leaves can be harvested and dried. Yeah, and that whole, that whole world of um, drying and crumbling leaves and making tea goes back long yeah, time. Yeah. long, long time. And so it's a fascinating world. And myself, I'm a good coffee drinker and, and a tea drinker as well. And, and I, I, I appreciate the um, uniqueness uh, of the taste. Right. It's, it's not something you have every day. So appreciate people sharing that. And, and also the comment about something maybe not being compatible in Alberta or maybe not even being sold in Alberta or, or, mm -hmm. or seed laws maybe not even allowing it. Yeah. That's, why, that's why you always want to find that person that, that you can work with once you kind of have a list to gather, uh, find that person. And then, you know, sort, sort any of that out, obviously, ahead of time is better, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. And this was a question, is that Himalayan balsam that you did plant? Uh, no, oh, it, okay. had, it, had, it had a different name. Okay. Uh, it, it was not Himalayan. Yeah. I think there's a number of different varieties. Okay. Uh, had some question. My question about companion planting. Will a 50 foot by 30 foot garden have enough space between plants that are companions or enough space for plants that do not do well together? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, 50, that, that's not a real big garden, but yet, yet there's a lot of plants can be in that garden. I mean, mm -hmm. I, would, I would try some. Uh, you know, when I move into trying some uh, arrangements on that, uh, I had a nice email uh, from Canada regarding, um, I believe it was, um, I want to say onion and carrot. Right, and, yeah. And, and how, how this doesn't take up a lot of room. It was a great email and a lot of great suggestions. And uh, I, think, I think there is an opportunity in there. You know, do the carrots really need to be two, three feet away uh, from the onions? Uh, maybe, maybe put them in there together and, and see how that plays out. Try, try a row or try a small area. And I think the companion cropping offers a lot. And really, when you think about it, uh, for a smaller garden, it, there's some opportunities that'll give you to grow additional plants that you maybe wouldn't get otherwise. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the greatest clients I ever had had a um, uh, lived in an apartment and had a pot of soil on the deck and was extremely passionate <laughs> about soils and and you know I had I had clients that had 40,000 acres of farmland and I had a client that had a pot of soil and you know, on a deck <laughs> and, and they were equally passionate and and so uh, and sometimes you don't need that big an area and you can be a bit more creative on this but I think a, a smaller garden has opportunity uh, for that as okay. well. Absolutely. Okay. Does bare soil release much carbon to the air compared to soil covered in mulch? Yeah. Where you're going to, what's going to happen, the surface mulch, most of the carbon in the surface mulch is going to oxidize probably 85% of it and go to the atmosphere. Okay. So wh whatever's laying on the soil surface that's dead litter, that's really just your protection for the most part. You'll get a small amount of carbon out of that, but most of it's going to oxidize and go to the soil surface. And and as far as the soil itself, uh, it's once we uh, once we disturb it and we add air, uh, the feeding frenzy is then on because now the biology can get at other biology it couldn't before. And so what that what happens then is you get this spike of CO2 to the atmosphere because now the the big guys can find get access to more of the little guys and the feeding frenzies on during that tillage period. And so you, all the work that's been done on this over the years is that's, that's when your big spike is going to occur of CO2. And so that's very difficult to build carbon levels then or to build soil organic matter levels uh, in that environment. So we try to minimize, try to minimize the disturbance. Knowing that, knowing that the dead litter, most of that's gonna to go to the atmosphere. Okay. Well, here's the ultimate compliment, Jay. Would you consider a garden series on CBC, which is a television station? 
<laughs> this person says, I think you have a lot of knowledge that would benefit people interested in carbon capture gardening. So. Well, you know, I, I'm more familiar and comfortable in the carbon arena uh, because that, there's a lot of people on this webinar and the previous two webinars that have way more garden experience than I do. My advantage is that, that I did a lot of long-term gardening in soils. I, excuse me, a lot of long-term monitoring in soils. And so that, that gave me my foundation that when I moved into gardening, I felt pretty comfortable with some things. Right. But I, I've had my butt kicked so many times in gardening. It's unbelievable <laughs> as I've been learning this process because it's not, it's not easy. A lot of people make it look easy, but it isn't always easy. Um, our, neighbor, our neighbor lady, I think is 91 years old. She's had a hip replaced uh, recently and she's still a master gardener. And awesome. so, so, you know, sometimes she and I stand in the backyard across the fence from each other, you know, and we tell tall tales to each other about gardening. And, and so it, it's just, I, I really appreciate people that have been on here because the gardening aspect is just, it, it's just great. You know, yeah. and, and I, feel, I feel there's more we can do with it and then when we figure that out, we have to move this more into the cropland arena as well. And so mm -hmm. I've been working hard in that Absolutely. area for a long time because we got to make changes in our cropland. Yeah. And um, but but there's no reason the gardening can't lead the way. Next question: In your first session, you stated soil should have five percent soil organic matter. Why only five percent? Uh, that was because of the easy math. Uh, if you remember, it's 45% uh, um, uh, mineral, uh, sand, silt, and clay, and then there was 25% water and 25% um, air, and those are uh, water and air, that would be, you know, a lot of that would be in the pore spaces. And then, of course, you got this 5% number left, and so I just called it, it it's soil organic matters all over the board in terms of, um, you know, it can be it can be uh, way less than 1%. Uh, it can be 7 or 8% and uh, anything in the middle. So the 5% was nothing more than easy math. Don't, don't read into it. <laughs> <laughs> Although 5% is a good number. But it depends on where you are in the nation, you know, in North America. Uh, yeah. You know, 5% in Texas would be unbelievable. But 5% in Manitoba is not unbelievable because of winter. Yep. yep. Right. Can you tell me anything about Native American sweetgrass? No, I can't. Um, I, I, I would have to say I just know of it. I, mm -hmm. I've never grown it. I don't know. Um, I don't know what uh, species that actually even is uh, where it would fall into. That's a good question. Yeah, um, I'm feeling a Google search coming up uh, a little later this evening, but uh, no, I, I do not know, but it's a, it's a great question. Okay, next question was tips for growing bee balm. I tried one year and nothing came up. <laughs> well, um, something that, that I take a look at now and then is uh, sometimes if you grow growing, I'm assuming we're talking growing from seed. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're growing from seed, uh, there's nothing wrong. My seed germination improved uh, when I started to use the liquid extract. And, and sometimes if I'm prepared enough, I can actually soak the seed for a few hours and then plant it. Mm -hmm. And so I would maybe give something like that a try because the, the uh, vermiculture liquid extract, or if you want to call it worm juice, whatever you want to call it, uh, improved my germination. Right. Yep. And so that would be a thought because uh, some of these seeds are quite hard and uh, they, they benefit from uh, a soaking for a period of time. Uh, I'm not saying this is one, I haven't looked into it, but I do that with some of mine and that does help me a bit. Okay. All right. Then just lots of um comments in the chat session and in q a just thanking you very much jay oh. for uh, all the information and that you should be on tv so i guess you'll have to start your own series well you're you're all very kind and 
like I said, the hospitality uh, coming out of Canada has always been second to none, in my opinion. I've never had a bad experience in Canada. So, well, that's good to I, hear. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I've always, I've always appreciated the wit, the wit and the wisdom. And, and um, I, I think, you know, we just share, getting together and sharing information, yep. uh, especially in the gardening arena uh, or anything else in terms of soil regeneration, I think is real important for us to do. And finding what's what's doable for us in our landscape and our locale. What can I, what's reasonable here? And I think there's a lot that we can do. And so I, I appreciate um, uh, your comments and I wanna extend those back. Thank you very much, I appreciate it as well. Okay. There is a comment that there is a USDA NRCS handout on sweetgrass. Okay. There we go. All right. There we go. Yep. And just a reminder to everybody that has joined us that all of these sessions were recorded and they are available on the NPARA website, just npara.ca. And following this later this week, you will be sent a link for the webinar. So all three of them are on there so you can watch them at your leisure. And uh, I know I will be going back and rewatching to uh, learn again, so. I don't think there's actually, again, just lots of accolades, Jay. This um, was very, very well received. I can't thank you enough for oh, joining welcome. us and doing this with us, Jay. It's been so informative, so much great information, and it is very good to learn how to apply the soil health principles to gardening. So thanks thank again, you. Jay. It's been yeah. awesome, and uh, we look forward to... Uh, I'm hoping to eventually visit the Monocon farm and see you then. So and, thanks and anyone's again. Welcome. Anyone's welcome to yes. come to the Monocon farm at any time. So very All good. All right. Okay. You take good care of yourself, yeah. Jay. Have a Thank wonderful you. summer. I hope you receive some moisture. Likewise. Thanks again. Take yeah. care. Bye now. Bye. Bye now.